Um, my name is Douglas Bogart. Uh, this is my panel. Um, I got cool effects on PowerPoint. That's what you came to see. The entire thing's in wingdings. Um, it says an afternoon with limited run. Um, so then we're going to go to just a little bit more about limited run. Um, yeah, limited run is uh, we started in 2015 with our first title in October um, with Breach and Clear on Vita. And we did 1,500 units kind of as just a, um, a gamble. We're an offshoot of Mighty Rabbit Studios. We were running out of money. And we were like, let's uh, put one of our games physical just so it has a lasting appeal. And uh, let's see if anyone will buy it. And we didn't really expect much. We planned on bulldozing the rest of the copies that didn't sell. And it sold out in 120 minutes, so or 108 minutes. So it went really well. Um, a little bit about me. Um, just kidding. We can we can drop the wing dings joke now. Now we're in impact. So I'm the king of bad fonts. I already I did a panel recently in Papyrus, and then the one before that in Comic Sans. I felt like wing dings would be my my swan song. Anyway, oh damn, I didn't even read it correctly. It's, it starts off about me. Uh, I worked in retail for eight years. I worked at Best Buy, and they now have part of my soul. Um, I also did technical support for Ubisoft for about two years. I was also a GM on a failed game called Ghost Recon Phantoms. Um, I was also a tester, technical support, and community management at Mighty Rabbit for three years before we spun off to do Limited Run. The first console I ever owned as a kid that was mine and not my dad's was the Super Nintendo, and my favorite game is Fantasy Star Online, as well as my co-founders. And then here we go for Limited Run. Ah, uh, yeah, again, launched in 2015. It was founded by Josh Fairhurst, the uh, president of Mighty Rap Studios, and me. Uh, we've been best friends since 2000, so it's one of those rare instances where two friends could actually run a company. Uh, originally part of Mighty Rabbit, and as of this panel, we've done 86 releases. So, pretty insane. It'd be a lot higher, but uh, we now have to have ESRB ratings, and that kind of slowed everything down. God, those, those effects, though. Um, our goal is at uh, Limited Run Games is to help preserve games for history. Um, we are also here to help developers gain additional revenue on a format they may not have tried to do themselves due to roadblocks such as distribution or financial reasons, because it is a lot of money to do what we do. Um, that's another reason why our games are limited. It's to ensure that they sell out and we can move on to the next project instead of being stuck with all these games that nobody wants. Uh, and then the selfish reason is mainly that we wanted to own these games ourselves. So we picked out games that we wanted to physically own, and then we went after those first. That's the coolest effect. So our initial struggles were basically creating and finding a shipping partner. Uh, when we first started, we had a, it was me doing all the shipping. Uh, that was really bad. And it took me a really long time to ship and figure out a good way to do it. And then we had a, another shipping partner that didn't understand what collectibles were, and they were not shipping them properly. Like they were shipping the wrong games out. They were doing a terrible job at shipping them in the first place. They were, everything ended up broken and missing. So then we found another partner, and now we're like doing really well. Uh, customer support was really hard, that was all me. When the company started for the first year and a half, it was just two people running the whole thing. So Josh and I split up a lot of the stuff, and it was, it was pretty tough. Uh, customer support was bad. I started my answers to people, started going from a paragraph going, I'm so sorry for everything, to okay. So. Uh, that was no longer personable, so we had to hire a support team. And then uh, convincing developers what we do is probably the hardest thing, because the first convention I went to was PlayStation Experience, and all we had done was Breach and Clear on Vita. So at the time, Vita was considered dead, and Breach and Clear was a game no one had heard of. So I'm going up to all these developers, showing them what this is, and they're like, I don't need, like, did you make this yourself? And I'm like, it's real. Like, I can do this for you. Um, thankfully, I didn't have too many roadblocks at PSX, and that's how we signed Nuclear Throne, um, Salt and Sanctuary we signed there, which the, well, ironically a lot of these games haven't come out yet. Um, and there's another big one that I can't talk about yet that we'll be announcing, I think, at the end of this month. And then, um, yeah, oh, never mind. It seems like all the games I signed there we haven't even released. What a weird thing. And then uh, getting press coverage was really tough too because like nobody cared about physical games. The, the biggest magazine is Game Informer and they're owned by GameStop. And it's, I thought I was gonna have trouble getting into that magazine because GameStop obviously would see us as a competitor even though we don't do the same thing. Thankfully Game Informer 
from what I've learned, doesn't abide by everything GameStop says, and they kind of do what they want. So we got in there finally, and then we got on a bunch of small ones, like the Vita Lounge had their own like magazine they shipped out to Patreon people. Um, and the hardest thing we had to do was finding the right unit size to sell out. So again, we based this around the idea, it's, it's kind of based, the co if my co-founder was here, he would talk about Beanie Babies for like an hour. So he was a big Beanie Baby person, and the reason why Beanie Babies ended up failing was it was too easy at the end of the Beanie Babies lifespan to get them. So the hype was dead. It's kind of like Amiibos. Everybody was buying the Amiibos and selling them, and they were worth something, and you didn't want it until you saw it was worth money. Now that Amiibos are getting easier to find, you're like, eh, I'll go get it another day. I do, I do the exact same thing. Oh, screw you, Norton. All right. I'm very unprofessional. I'm just going to, like, rant. Um, we'll probably get a Windows update, too. And uh, yeah, basically, so it's kind of designed around Beanie Babies and the idea that you want these things because it's hyped. You want it also because you want you like the game itself. The idea is to find a balance to where we can have enough that everyone who wanted it can get it and then still sell out. So like my ideal sell is a weekend. I would prefer to keep everything in stock from Friday through Sunday. The whole weekend to get it. Hopefully you're not at work the whole weekend or out of town. If you're out of town and you're a huge fan of us, we do work with people to try to help them get the game if they missed out just by contacting us and like show us your collection or like there was one guy who was scared he was gonna miss night trap and he had a night trap tattoo and I was like well I feel like this guy deserves it if he can't but he ended up getting it so I didn't have to like do much but had he not he would have been okay um, our future plans that kind of help the company grow is to increase the customers base to increase our print size because the goal is to do more um, Originally, this panel was going to be hinting heavily at Nintendo Switch. Uh, then my co-founder announced it without telling me. So, I, uh, never mind. But the idea with Switch is to do bigger print runs just because, you know, with Switch, the audience is there. Uh, there's a lot of hype around it. People are still having trouble getting the console, at least in other areas, not where I live. But uh, there's still no Switch games. You, you basically have a few choices, like Nicalis games, or you have uh, Lego game, like a bunch of games from AAA companies that aren't even all the way on the cartridge, which is something we're going to try to avoid, unless there's a weird indie game that's over 32 gigabytes. Uh, I can see that happening. So we're going to try to increase the print run, uh, and that way we're going to try to get better advertisement and make sure that everybody can get a copy. Uh, we're trying to have better community interactions, the reason why I'm at these shows. Uh, I try to show you that you know we're not just two businessmen, we're actually real people that play games just like you and collect. And if my wife wasn't on this trip with me, I would have already spent all our money at the show. Um, but I'm not going to be good. Uh, another thing I'm working on is funding localization to bring games over. I'm currently working on a couple of contracts, I can't pronounce my keys, to uh, get a few games over from Japan, for Vita especially, because there's we're running low on Vita stuff. There's The content's no longer there. A lot of Western developers have kind of abandoned the Vita for whatever reason, but in Japan it's still going strong. I go there about almost twice a year, and the Vita sections are like walls, all over Toys R Us there, uh, in their regular game stores like Super Potato, there's brand new games. And then you go back to GameStop, and there's like two two rows, and it's like four by four, and that's it. And it's like really bad ones usually, like just mad, which is actually getting rare, so, which is another weird thing to say out loud. Um, the other thing we want to start doing is start publishing digitally, so when we do fund these games, we're going to start trying to do digital distribution. It also gives us another way to market it better and maybe possibly give keys out to people who don't want to open their physical copy. Um, it's just an idea. Also, it's another way to get revenue and guarantee that we can stay in the game longer. Um, we're also now trying to go after mid to high tier games. So with Night Trap and Wonder Boy, we saw a huge amount of success. Uh, so much so that we were like, wow, we didn't print enough, um, even though we had doubled what we were going to do. Why are you doing this to me? Why don't you love me? All right. Sorry about that. It was Norton. Um, so the idea is to get more games like that, uh, as well as still trying to do the occasional really, really small uh, game that nobody's heard about. Uh, the, the whole company is based around games that Josh and I like. So if we like the game, we feel like it deserves a, a run, even if we think only three people are going to buy it. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, and there's the switch hint. Yeah, that field. Um, yeah, so... We're also trying to get on Xbox. That's a big thing we're working on. We've been negotiating for a while. Uh, Nintendo was gonna. I was gonna hint that we're trying. We've been working on Nintendo for like past six months since GDC. That was uh, March. Um, that finally got approved not long ago. 
So we're currently working on that. We're getting set up. It's really exciting, uh, especially since I was a Nintendo fanboy as a kid. Um, it wasn't until like the Wii that they kind of lost me for a while, just because I wasn't into motion controls, and also it wasn't HD. And then the Wii U came out, and we all know what happened there. Um, but I, I was always a big Nintendo boy, so this is like a dream come true, because like my 64 was like really special to me. And so was my GameCube, because Fantasy Star Online was on there. Um, so we're going to be doing Switch uh, starting quarter one. I will say this to everybody who's like a huge fan of us, and but was also stressed out from how much we were putting out. We're planning to keep Switch at one a month, so don't need to worry as much there, unlike PS4, where we were assaulting you with like eight titles a month. And then ironically, you can take the ESRB for slowing that down, but then that also causes its own problems. Um, so yeah, we're really excited. It's, uh, it's a huge deal for us, uh, as well as still working on Sony. We're not giving up on the Vita. You know, people assumed as soon as we announced Switch, they're like, oh, you're dropping Vita, and this is your new portable. And we're like, why would, no, we're gonna keep going until Sony says no. Um, so then the next goal is to do Xbox. We're gonna do some more small PC runs, but those are typically just gonna be pre-orders, and that's it. Uh, just because those are easy to make, and why not? Some people still love the big boxes. Uh, like, I was just at Metal Jesus' house not long ago, and he has an entire basement full of the big box PC stuff. So it just goes to show there's still people out there that love those things. Um, what's next? Well, yeah, then I was mainly going to do mostly a Q&A. This original panel was supposed to be set up to... You. It was going to be me and John Riggs discussing the scalper myth, but it looks like there's a panel today with Reggie that's already doing that. So it's good I didn't do that, and it's also good I was too busy. Um, so yeah, plenty of q and don't. You can ask whatever you want. Uh, go for it. Let's do guy in the back first. All right, uh, maybe a lot, but what's, what's your projected lineup for the Switch? Because I'm actually excited for what's going to be released on there. Um, I can't discuss what we have yet. Um, I can tell you our first title is a really big one that's going to blow everything out of the park. Um, as well as... We are planning on trying to do some of the games that we've done previously on PS4. Uh, like, I just got contacted by one of the big devs we did a PS4 Vita launch with, and they asked us if we'd be interested in doing it for Switch now that they heard we're on Switch. So, obviously, I'm going to take that. Um, it's, it, they're all going to be bigger names. Uh, we're reaching out to as many people as we can. So, I think people are going to be excited, and we're going to try to do... We're going to try to include something in every box because we don't want it to just be like vanilla. We don't want you to open it, especially, and see just a white background. So, like, I don't know if anybody's bought the few Switch games there are. There's a few of those that you open it up and you're like, oh, they put no thought into this. But we're definitely going to try to, like, since we're only doing one a month and we hired somebody full time just to handle the Nintendo stuff, we're going to really make it special. That's cool because, yeah, the Switch is really what I'm excited about. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And you had a question? Yeah, uh, for, I guess one of the issues with Xbox One was their minimum requirement for ordering, right? Is there, like, how high is that? I mean, is it 30,000 or? Um, it's technically NDA to discuss what it is. Um, I've also been given different numbers from different Xbox people, so I'm not entirely sure, but it is really high to the point where I'd be called unlimited uh, run games. And I would probably, that would be honestly what kill, kills the company just because the Xbox market isn't as big on collecting as Sony's side is, um, but Josh is a big Xbox fan, and I used to be on the 360 side, so we still wanted to do it just because, I mean, it feels bad leaving them out. Like, when we did Night Trap, all we heard was, what about Xbox? And it was like, well, you know why, but we're hoping to fix that, and we're hoping to make it special and try to do, like, a simultaneous launch where we do, like, all three platforms at once. You can kind of choose your platform or all three. Anybody else? Go ahead. Awesome. For the Switch, are you going to try to stick to the 10 above digital still, or is there extra manufacturing that's going to cost yeah. it? Yes, there is. So I've noticed that the people are that are doing it uh, seem to do uh, like a Switch tax almost. They increase the price substantially, uh, which is weird because like I can't give you the numbers, but the Vita production costs are about on par with what the Switch production costs are, so I'm kind of curious why these people decided that was okay. Probably because the market was already doing that. Um, but really, it doesn't cost that much more to do Switch, so the idea was maybe our games would just start at 30 base, and then like like we always do, $10 over the digital if it surpasses that. So we're trying to keep it that way. Um, obviously, collector's editions will cost more, but we don't want to be killing people's wallets with Switch stuff like some of, the, some of our competitors and just other people are doing. 
Try to keep it fair. No problem. Anybody else? It can be anything. I really don't care. Go ahead. So it's possible to see some of the games that you already released on a different console, like for a new release. For example, something that is already, I don't know, like you say on the beat and now on the Switch. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Um, for example, Josh developed Saturday Morning RPG, and he's been really looking forward to hopefully trying to get that game onto Switch. That would be a really cool thing to do. Um, that would be that's one. And then there's a couple of developers that have started porting their games to Switch because Switch is right now the current hot trend. Uh, so we would like to bring those over as well, um, and be the one that does the physical, just because we feel like that's the next evolution in the company and gaming. So. Yes, sir. It's the uh, story behind the one box jewel cases you guys are releasing. Oh yeah, so uh, for anybody who's a big collector in here, which I would assume everybody in here is, um, if you had Sega CD games or anything in the long box ones, you probably have a bunch that have cracks or like the hinges are broken because those things are notoriously fragile. And you're probably doing what my co-founder was doing and buying the sports games that are real cheap on Amazon and replacing the good games with them. Uh, the idea is that we have found a way to make the mold itself and mass produce them so that we can be basically the only person you can get these from. Um, but we're only, the, the idea is to charge them like at a fair price. Uh, and it was a huge investment, but we feel like it's worth it for the collector community. The idea is that we're trying to, we're gonna, we've been working on doing uh, a lot more accessories and collectible protection stuff uh, and kind of launch like a side brand. Because like with our games, you can buy a protective sleeve for it. You can buy it for your cards. Uh, the idea is to now start doing that for like we're we're working on a Vita protective case that has our brand on it, and it's actually a hard shell case that can hold a few games in it, as well as maybe a power cable and your Vita. So we want to do that as long as well as uh, try to get these long boxes out. And we're thinking of ways to do it. Like we maybe we'll do a Kickstarter where you can back it, and you can get like a, as many as you want at a, at like an early bird price. And then we'll just sell them at like a standard price, probably something like five bucks, which is pretty cheap, considering you pay like 15 for that bad sports game, sometimes 20, just to replace a case. Uh, so we're really excited to do that, and we're going to offer more stuff, uh, more replacement cases for other games and uh, classic stuff that's been destroyed, just because a lot of the stuff previous gens have, uh, they were notoriously fragile, like your Super Nintendo boxes. Like, I don't think that's a plan, but that's a good example of something that's always crushed. Especially me as a kid, I, I never even thought of keeping those boxes. And now as an adult, I'm like, what have I done? But, uh, yeah. Anyone else? Oh, quick. How do you draw, you say you draw the line as far as keeping it limited to not go to game days. Where do you draw the line financially to make sure that you as a company stay going forward and keeping customers happy, you know, with these percentage ones? Um, the way we discuss the run size, we, we talk to the developer, we look at their previous sales, especially digitally, we look at the long-lasting appeal of the brand, uh, if the developer themselves have a name behind them, uh, how much we like the game, if we can do a collector's edition, if we can bundle it with the soundtrack. There's a lot of variables in it. Um, none of them are concrete yet, but let's see, it, it basically we just have to sell Depending on the run, anywhere from a th maybe like a thousand to fifteen hundred to break even, and at that point, honestly, we if we can break even and just make a little bit of extra money, as long as the developers getting their share, it doesn't really bother as much because uh, it used to be on the website, but it, we took it down just because nobody was paying attention anyway. But for the most part, it's seventy. The developers get like seventy percent, so we we give them a huge chunk of the the revenue. And the idea is like again, we did this to help them. Because as a developer, we were struggling to get money all the time, and it's such a hard thing to do to get like your stuff printed. You need to be able to like contact Sony or Nintendo, and you need a big chunk of change to do this right up front. And a lot of people they get loans, and then like, what if you printed too many? Uh, Josh remembers what it is, but there's like a DS game that this one guy did, and his his now his garage is just full of them. Like it was his game, and he printed them, and he can't find anyone to buy them because it just he printed way too many. And again, Nintendo at the time had a really high print run. So that was something we wanted to avoid, and we were thankful Sony allowed us to do smaller runs. Uh, obviously, we still missed the ball sometimes. Night Trap, we could have printed more. Wonder Boy, we could have printed more. I could probably do this for all, all day, for a couple. And then other times, people like say we don't print enough, and then we print them, and then nobody shows up, and it's kind of weird. Like It takes longer to sell out, and then 
perception is, oh, let me run the ending, and it's like, what? Like, not really, just this game. Like an up and down battle sometimes. Uh, anybody else? Do you have any suggestions on how to preserve digital only release games? I know, for instance, like Cuphead just came out, and that's like a digital only game for Xbox and PC, but you know they don't have a physical release, so like if you don't get, I know it's saved up in the cloud, but for games that like, like Chris and like Blackie Bird, where you can't get that anymore, um, it's something way to get it is to buy a phone that had it that never got updated. So it's like, do you have any suggestions on how you can do a better job for preserving digital only release games? Um, the only way to really preserve those isn't technically legal, uh, for the most part, uh, but yeah, you're right, the only way to preserve a lot of those, like, mobile games is to put it on a phone. For example, I think right now, Bridge and Clear and Saturday Morning RPG, which were both originally iOS games, don't even play on the current, um, firmware. So, like, you basically have to hold on to an old iPhone to play those until they're updated, if they are updated. Um, there's really no good way to do it unless you hack the code and like download it to your computer and kind of like emulate it in a way, uh, which sucks. Because I mean, I get in this argument all the time with like kids who don't seem to understand why this is important. When the, um, especially like when I talk about games like Scott Pilgrim, I'm like, the only way you can play this is to buy a console with it on it. And they're like, or I can download it. And I'm like, yeah, but it's not the same. You have to hack your console to do it, or you're playing it on the computer and it just doesn't feel the same to me. Um, and then usually it's unstable. So there's really no good way to do it. The best thing you can do is ask the developers continuously to preserve their games. Um, I have a feeling, I, I'm not saying this because I know anything, but I have a feeling Cuphead is getting a physical. I feel like they did. They've been hinting at it heavily, yeah. So, and there's no reason for it not to, especially because that game's great. Um, I do wish that Microsoft didn't have an exclusive on it, but that's its own story. But yeah, honestly, there's not really much of a way except pushing for the developer to do it. Like Square Enix, for example, didn't want to uh, publish um, I Am Setsuna. And their next game by the same company, it is going to be physical. So I, people spoke up, but it still doesn't make sense why they didn't retroactively go and do it. Um, anyone else? Sir? Are you still seeing a strong demand for Vita games? Yes, so Vita, for a, at one point we thought Vita was starting to die. And I keep hearing this story while I'm at my booth too. Like people will come by and be like, oh, you have Vita games. I sold my Vita. And you're just like, really? But then you have to realize, too, if you sold your Vita, somebody else out there probably bought it. So we do see, like, spikes in Vita stuff, depending on the game. And then sometimes we see, like, a, a like almost go at, a, like, a snail pace. And then other times it shoots back up and Vita outsells the PS4 one. Um, so we have a few games coming out. Like, we announced Valhalla, uh, which is a big one. And that game has a huge print run, as well as a collector's edition. There's another game I'm doing that I'm finalizing. I think the total print size is, like, Somewhere close to 10K, it's like split up into collector's edition and that because it has a worldwide audience. It's, it's probably the biggest Vita title we'll ever have done. Um, so I'm really excited to do that one. And honestly, that's a game if I like, I ended up stuck with like a thousand copies with that couldn't sell, I could just go to Anime Expo and probably sell them. Because it's Japanese, so. Uh, next. Uh, so how many people have actually redeemed 70 tickets to go to game? We've had a few. Um, yeah, I think it's 40. Yeah, so the 40, yeah, I think we've had a few people in this. We're actually getting ready to... Um, there's one developer who really has a game that we think could do really well, but he wanted to do more copies, and they're in like a tight spot, and we're thinking maybe like the best way to help him is to offer an exclusive version of it that's just for tickets and for our rewards. So we've had a lot of people redeem it. I felt bad because most of the tickets we got were people trying to redeem for the 32X Night Trap. And that got killed because we, we would have to get that game rated just for a cover that was going to be not technically sold. So it didn't make sense for that investment. Anyone else? Oh. Any update on the So at my booth I have the PS4 version. That one is ready to go. We got the soundtrack in. We got the pencil board in. Uh, that'll start shipping either next week or the week after. Uh, Vita, I, it just, it's getting uh, passed through FQA right now with Sony and it's about done. I think it is done. So it's about to go into production. And then that nightmare will be over. Um, again, thank you for everyone who got Skullgirls and has been patient with us and understands that it 100% isn't our fault. I'm not pushing that on anyone, but it was like beyond my control. Um, thankfully, we're almost done. 
And then whatever's left, we'll try to sell that in the next few months just oof, to people who missed out. But it won't be very many copies. Oh, you had one. When you have to shut those in line, is there any demand where you think there's anything like for old generation, previous generation days? Oh, like to like have them bring, like to bring to PS4 or? No. To do a physical? Uh, there is a demand. We had a couple of people ask us if we would be interested in doing like a PS3 physical of a couple games. The problem with that is it takes more, it's more work for the developer because previous generation games run off the CD versus now they just install. Um, so there is demand there. Uh, the problem is there's not as much demand because these people still don't own a lot of, like I said, people have said they sold their Vitas. I've met plenty of people that sold their PS3s and Xbox 360s. Especially now that Xbox is trying to be as backwards compatible as possible. Um, there's a demand. For, unfortunately for games like Scott Pilgrim, there's license issues. And that, that goes for a lot of other games. These licenses have expired. Uh, you'll find a game where it's like, everything in the game is okay, but the music has suddenly expired. Like, I don't know if anybody downloaded Crazy Taxi on 360, but that is not the soundtrack you played on Dreamcast. There's no old classic offspring anymore. So. A lot of these games, they can't be preserved the way you remember them just because there's some license issue. Uh, you had a question next? Yeah, are you still going to utilize the uh, pre-order system after it's full rules? Um, so we tried it for East Origin and it did about what we were going to do anyway. Um, so we decided that if there's enough demand and it's a bigger title, like if we had another Night Trap, uh, we will we'll be doing that. Like for example, we're really pushing hard to see if we can do a game like Double Switch. Um, and I feel like that would be a game we'd probably open up pre-orders for. So for the bigger titles, yes, we'll probably do that. But only if the game's ready in production. We'll never do a game again where, like Skull Girls, where it wasn't ready yet, because that has literally been like my life. It's just answering questions about that. And then, uh, yes sir. Well, you have on the ESRG, better question, what are they coming into with you guys? What are they, what are they throwing, what change are they throwing into you guys? <coughs> So, uh, without negatively reflecting on the SRB, they previously on all platforms, they got all the platform holders to comply, um, and the way it made sense was Sony was the last one, and I guess they figured if everybody else is doing it, why, why aren't we? Which sucks, but it, it is what it is, and it makes sense. And in all fairness, some of our games are ending up in like mom and pop shops, but that's not the reason why this happened. Uh, the holdup now is getting your game rated is a very tedious process. The digital rating, for example, is done by the developer. They pick out what they what they what the game has. They fill out a form, and then they, the ESRB assigns a rating basically automatically. And the only way that's challenged is if the ESRB eventually later plays that game and says, "Whoa, you failed to disclose that." For the physical one, an actual panel reviews it. So you have to send in footage of the game. You have to fill out this really intricate. Form. Uh, you have to be extremely detailed, which I was not at first. And if not, you get sent a violation for things that make you laugh. But uh, that's what they do. And then you have to kind of fight that, and then redo the whole thing. And it, it's also really expensive to get a physical rating. They did help developers and people like us by lowering the price a bit, but it's still, in my my opinion, way too high. Um, especially since they're not considering the run size. They're only considering the game itself. Uh, but yeah, it's, for example, October was supposed to be full of games of like Salt and Sanctuary, Claire, Layers of Fear, which are like Halloweenish games. And all those games got delayed because they were M-rated, and M-rated games are like all really hard to get rated. Like, I can't imagine what x goes through to get Cinder and Kagura rated. It's just boobs everywhere. Like, how many times can you say there's a boob here? Um, and I never noticed that the covers technically aren't the same covers either. Like, if you buy a Cinder and Kagura game, and they have a reversible cover, and it's the Japanese cover, and it shows a little bit more cleavage, and then you flip it over and see the American cover, and they suddenly they're wearing like an undershirt that doesn't actually exist, and you're like, oh, they did that because of the SRB. So, for example, Cloud Juice Blaze, I can say this is kind of funny. Uh, that was the first game we ever sent in to get our cover reviewed, that they were like, oh, this is, uh, this is kind of objectionable, you can't use this, even though the Asian release had it. It was the one with like the two girls' chest touching. It was like the first time I've ever been told, like, this is kind of pushing it. And I'm like, really? Like, you've already released this technically in another region. And they're like, yeah, but that's that region and that's that culture. So it just goes back to show you, like, it's, it's different everywhere. It is also funny to me and everyone else that this kind of happened around the time we were putting out Night Trap. 
It was like full circle. Like, so anyone else? Yes, sir. So you're interested in knowing like what the timeline is and like some of the steps? Just a little bit of the process, like because uh, my steps are probably most things to do in order to bring it game. Oh, okay. Um, well, it starts off with negotiations with the developer. Um, and that can take anywhere from a day to a year, uh, in some cases too. There's one game, for example, that we're just now finally getting ready to do, and I, I signed at the first PSX in 2015. So it just goes to show it can take a while. Um, but once that's done, I guess the best example would be like Firewatch. Like that was a game we had done so fast we had actually forgot to do a couple of steps like that we normally would have because um, they were just so ready to get it done. So the, the, you start there, the, you decide with the developer, like what would you like to include in the box? What, kind of, would, what art do you guys have available? Do you have an engineer ready that you can submit the build to Sony? Because uh, it'll have to go through a, another process of FQA and like get all that done. Uh, and so basically the timeline is for PS4, if everything works like a miracle, you can get it done as fast as a month. For Vita, it's about two because it, it takes longer to do the cartridges. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of work. Um, Vita can be a lot more work just because if the Vita build isn't submitted correctly, you have to redo it as if it's a new game. Um, but that's just another developer thing. Uh, great, thankfully, because we split off from a development company, we still have engineers on staff that can help developers. Uh, for example, Broken Age Vita wouldn't have happened unless our Mighty Rabbit team was able to help them with that because they were busy working on their new game and they were like, hey, we don't really have the time. We can do PS4 and we're like, well, we really want it on Vita. Like, we'll do the work for free if that's what it takes. So that's just like the extra step we'll go through like to help do this. A lot of times, a lot of stuff we do is for free just to make sure that these games exist. Uh, next. So you mentioned you could have earlier. I heard that the reason it doesn't hold up so long is because there's a bug in the vehicle. Um, is there a reason why you went and sell the PS4 version now and then the Vita is ready? That's about where we're at now. Same with, uh, so we were waiting on Rami originally to patch Nuclear Throne on PS4 and Vita. We got PS4 done and then there was a hiccup on the Vita one, like it couldn't get through Sony's process of approving the, the patch. So what we're doing now is having the development team on our side work on that. But we have to get a Game Maker license and that's expensive and then he has to learn Game Maker and it's like this whole extra step. So in the meantime, we were discussing, we're like, well maybe we should just push the PS4 out first as much as that sucks and just let people know like, hey, it's still coming. Like don't hide that fact so then they get burned. Um, so, and we're at the same boat with Salt and Sanctuary. The Vita build wasn't the right build we needed for it, so we might do PS4 now and do Vita later. Um, it just sucks because Vita people are extremely passionate and that means I'm gonna have to answer a lot of angry messages because they're gonna assume I'm ditching the Vita even though I'm 100% still trying to bring it. But yeah, that, that is the idea. So going back to the Switch, um, without violating any, any NDAs, you, when you approach Nintendo, um, are you dealing with directly Nintendo of America, or are you doing with Japan? It's a combination of both. It's uh, Nintendo of America. Okay. Yeah. Have you felt that they are more open to the idea? With seeing the release of like the NES Classic coming out, it seems like um, Nintendo of America has finally gotten through to Japan and you know telling them that you know, the Americans do want to buy these games. Having like these continuing uh, well, along with physical releases, do you feel like? They're more open to the ideas now. I feel like Nintendo of America's entire attitude has changed since Wii U, because Josh and I originally approached them to do limited releases on Wii U, and they, it took a really long time to get through to anybody, and then finally when we got there, they were like, oh, yeah, you can try to uh, apply it to like release this game, but we probably won't approve it, because you know, Wii U like, support is kind of ending soon. And we're like, hmm, I wonder if that means something's coming. And then like two minutes later, they're like, switch. And we're like, oh, that's why. But like, they were very hesitant to do anything with Wii U, and they like just even like getting approved for Wii U, we would have to submit like basically our life story of the company and like documents that I would never have suspected somebody needed just to get approved. Like, they were very, very like hard on that. Uh, with Switch, they've been welcoming indies and publishers like us with open arms. Uh, they've been a lot more 
communicative, even though they are all extremely busy and behind on everything because they did not see the switch being this big, uh, which is really good for them. But it does suck also because they're just, I feel bad for them. They're like, they're so swamped. But they are very, very friendly. They're very open to it. Uh, someone asked me at the show, do I feel like Nintendo still kind of keeps the same mentality of like the seal of approval? And I would say yes without having that because they are still very particular. Like Nintendo wants their branding and everything to remain consistent, uh, which honestly isn't too far off from what Sony does, so we're not really, it's nothing that we aren't used to. It's just that, for example, if we include anything in the boxes, Nintendo's very particular about what goes in the box. So we're going to have to be, we're going to make sure everything is very kosher with them because this is kind of like a once in a lifetime thing for me and I don't want to ruin anything with Nintendo. Anybody else? Yes. For your localization, you mentioned bringing some media releases over to the middle of the What about something as big as like Secret Man? I'd like to do it. It's Square that's the problem. So I just recently went into my inbox to see who I had talked to at Square, and I had like 30 emails over the course of two years that I had sent to Square, like just saying, like, can I please do Adventures of Mana? Can I do I Am Sitsuna? Can I like help you do this? Can I tell you like what you should do to do this? And nothing. That's not to say I don't love the company, and I don't love it. It could just be that I'm getting the wrong people because I had got to people and then they would forward me to somebody else but then they, they don't tell you who they forward you to and you don't see who they did it to and then it just kind of dies. So I'd really like to bring it over. Um, we are bringing over some pretty well known titles from Japan and the idea is that if we localize them we're going to bring them not just to Vita but to PS4 and now Switch. So it'll be on multiple platforms because why not if we're investing the money. Um, and then again digital as well. We'll make sure that people can buy it both ways. Even though it would be funny to just do physical and be like, oh, it's just like the old days, that's when we could have got it. But then I would get a lot of angry people. Anybody else? Cool. Um, just to recap on some of the cool things we got coming out, we announced Next Machina. It's a Housemark game. Typically their games have only been uh, Sony first party games, such as Resogun, Dead Nation, Matterfall. That's all I got in my head right now. But yeah, they, uh, it's, it's going to be a huge deal. Uh, they approached us at GDC, which was kind of surprising. This is their first self-published game, so it's going to be a huge deal. Their soundtrack alone is amazing. If you like stuff like Carpenter Brute, or uh, if you enjoyed the soundtrack in Fury, anything like Dark Synth Wave. I don't really know what the genre is called. I just call it Dark Techno. Uh, it's really good. And we're going to, uh, Fan Gamer has already done some merch for it. So we're looking to partner with Fan Gamer and bring you some more cool stuff. We also announced La Milana, which is a really legendary Vita game series. Um, it's kind of like Indiana Jones inspired, and it's just on Vita, like strictly Vita. It's going to be amazing. Um, you have it on? Yeah, it's on Steam. Yep. In fact, I had to watch somebody playing on Steam to get through a walkthrough to submit to the SRB because that game is hard. Um, and if I actually ended up having to call Rising Star and was like, "Can you do this?" Like, do you know the game better? That's another cool thing. We got to partner with Rising Star, who people tried to say as a competitor, but they're not. Because uh, again, all these people, like, fi people think 505, or I think 505 thinks I'm a competitor, which is weird. Because uh, we're not retail. So that's another thing I'm trying to do with the company is to kill off this whole mentality of publishers can't work together. Because uh, we're all in the same, we're in the same business and we should be here to help fans and developers, not just be about the money, which, some of these companies, I guess, that, that is what it is. It's, it's always startling to me when I meet a head of a company and you can tell that they don't even play video games. But like, they know all the words and like the lingo, but you can tell they've never played any of these games that they're doing. And it just, I don't know, frustrates me because it's like, it is what it is though. Um, but yeah, and uh, what else do we got coming? We got Windjammers we announced. That'll be out hopefully in December. Uh, we're bringing some exclusives to PlayStation Experience. So if anybody can make it to Anaheim, we're going to have a lot of cool stuff there. Obviously, we'll do what we always do, and whatever doesn't sell will be available on the website. If you don't feel like you should have been at the show. Um, and what else? The Windjammers, we're doing a cool collector's edition. Really excited to do that with uh, .mu. And then uh, Fan Gamer, we're going to partner with to bring you some merch, because they, they have the license to do all the merch. I'm just going to let you know, with Fan Gamer, we're doing a lot of stuff together. Like, we are very close, and anything we can do to help like bring more merchandise out because they do a really good job of doing their stuff like they helped us with Broken Age like, they brought out the Broken Age art book and the plushie and we'll try to sell shirts too because people like buying those 
our Night Trap shirt sold really well. So maybe do some more stuff like that. Uh, more merch ideas. Uh, we're trying to bring, like, we have stands now made by Rose Colored Gaming. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with them. They do a really good job with retro stuff. And then uh, I'm trying to think what else we're going to do. Or should we just, like, spill the beans and everything? So, like, like, yeah, I know that's what you want. You just want me to tell you everything. I would love to. The Switch one, I'm like really excited for because it's a fan gamer partnership and it's ridiculous what we're doing. Like, oh, it's also on PS4, so we signed it for both. And if it could have been on Vita, we would have done that too. Huh? Yeah, I can't, I can't tell anybody, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be good. Oh yeah, Rabby Ribby is another game people keep asking me about with Sekai Project because uh, they announced everything like a year ago and then nothing's happened. But that game's about ready. Uh, you could technically already buy a physical one of that with PQ. But we did find an extra bug in it, and we wanted to make sure ours didn't have that, just to be safe. And we have the exclusive on Vita now, because I guess uh, they just didn't see the market for it in their area. Because, I mean, PQ is European, technically. So that's going to be exciting. And then we have Fault Milestone coming, Narsusu, and then a bunch of other games I can't pronounce um, from Sekai Project. And so anything they do, we're going to try to do. Um, like, they just signed a game by the guy who did a house, uh, a house in Fata Morgana his next game. That's going to be huge. I'm just going to be honest. House of Fata Morgana is the first game I'm trying to bring over. It's like a huge Vita game that's local. we're working on trying to get localized. So, it's not officially done yet, so I can't say it is what we're trying to do, but it, or I can say it's what we're trying to do. I'm not saying it is what we're doing. So, there we go. That's the bridge there. I can, I can vaguely say something. But yeah, I'm excited. Thank you for everybody who came out for the panel. Um, by the booth, I got a few stuff left, not much. I used to have like all the way down to there, and now I'm on one table, which is nice. But I should have brought another suitcase. And yeah, and then I don't mind just talking. That's why I'm here. So thank you again. I had here some. <laughs>